The Hestalm Phenomena Date of sighting Ever since the beginning of December 1981 Time Mostly during the evening at night 7.30 p.m. and 10.30 to 11 p.m. But also at many other times Place Around the Hestalm area 80 kilometers south of Trondheim Witnesses At least several dozens Nature of sighting Lights of various magnitude and intensity Together with cigars And egg-shaped objects Since the beginning of December 1981 Hundreds of UFO observations have been reported From the areas around Hestalm Valley And southern Norway Witnesses have told of strange lights phenomena for which no one, either laymen nor experts, has been able to give satisfactory explanation. A short description of the area in question is necessary. The Hestalm Valley lies in a mountain terrain circa 10 kilometers southwest of the village Olm, which has nearly 2,000 inhabitants. The valley itself has an altitude of some 600 to 700 meters above sea level, with nearby mountain tops up to 1000 to 1100 meters. The scenery here being rather desolate. In Hestalm there are only a few hundred inhabitants, living mostly in isolated farms. Their main income is from farming, forestry and some industry. Killingdal Mining Company wins copper rich Purite, about 15 km east of Hestalm. Moreover, the area bounds with old shutdown mines, which has been rich, especially in copper. The old mining town Røros lies 30 km to the south. A branch of the Norwegian State Railways Rørosbanen and State Road No. 30 pass through Olm. The village is situated in a larger valley in which the river Gaula floats to the west. The phenomena began to appear in Hestalm just as the UFO wave in Arndal ended. For the most part, they have appeared as lights of various magnitude and intensity. Flying between the mountain sides, they popped up in the south, moved with a wide range of speeds, stopped abruptly, ascended rapidly up in the air or accelerated sideways, etc. Many of the objects have no clearly defined shape, but others have been described as egg-shaped with some sort of windows of an old-fashioned type. Some other witnesses claim to have observed cigar-shaped or oblong objects with a kind of a strange diffuse light glow. In nearly every case only one object has been seen at a time and without any audible sound. A certain periodicity in the observations is noted about 7.30 pm and between 10.30 11 pm. But the phenomena have also appeared at many other times. The conditions of observation are very variable. Rain, snow, overcast without precipitate or clear sky. The temperature has varied between minus 30 degrees Celsius up to at least plus 5 degrees Celsius. The bulk of the report described nocturnal lights, but a couple of daylight observations have also been reported. On many of the observed objects, there have been seen powerful white blinking lights, comparable to the light from an electronic flash. When these blinking lights are observed, it has functioned as an indication of the distance Many witnesses claim that the UFO then is very nearby. In addition to this, pulsating red lights have been seen frequently, which in some cases were stable. In connection with a few observations, interference with TV reception has been reported. In one case, a dog reacted abnormally while a UFO passed nearby by lying down motionless. Later, it behaved quite normally. 
when the UFO wave was at its most intense during the early months of 1982 and people became aware of the phenomena. Among other things because of good coverage in the press and on radio and TV programs. Hundreds of interested people rushed to Hestalm and lined up on the main road in the valley, hoping to catch a glimpse of the famous UFO. On some occasions one could count up to 100 cars at a time on specific places. The UFO Norge Investigation UFO Norge made their first trip to Hestalen in the middle of March 1982. UFO Norge is the Norwegian UFO organization of invest- investigators into the UFO phenomenon in Norway. They had their first trip to Hestalen in the middle of March 1982 at a meeting held in the community center of Ålen on the 26th March. A short poll was carried out among the audience of 130 people. 14 of these were specifically from Hestalen Valley. A total of 30 persons had had one or more observations since December 1981. 17 had seen a yellow spherical light. 12 had seen a possible cigar-shaped object. 8 persons had seen a possible egg-shaped object. 6 persons had seen an oblong object with two yellow and one red light. One person had observed the phenomenon in daylight. 3 persons had registered failures on radio TV sets during an observations. One person had registered influence on animals. None had had any mental effects from their experiences. Nine persons had their UFO observations in Hestalen itself. One must stress that the fact that the poll was voluntarily and therefore not quite reliable Moreover, since that time, many more observations have been made, so that the results are somewhat out of date. In the mid part of February 1982, a TV team from the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation, NRK, came to Hestalen, hoping to film the phenomena. A total of 50 minutes, some 4 to 5 minutes of the light uh, phenomena was exposed, but at so great a distance that the value of the evidence was rather limited. About 1st December the same year, a correspondent from the Swedish Broadcasting Corporation Sveriges Radio arrived in the area. Besides making some radio interviews, on one occasion she also had the good fortune to see the phenomenon herself, however, without becoming a UFO freak. The NIVFO investigation. In addition to UFO Norge, another organization has carried out investigation of the Hestalen phenomena, namely NIVFO, Norwegian Institute for Scientific Investigation and Information. This organization has taken the first step towards processing the incoming reports statistical, something that can give us a hint about the true nature of the phenomenon. A statistical analysis of some 47 observations from Hestalen between the 4th of December 1981 to the 28th of October 1982 has recently been published. The findings relate only to reports which were collected and studied by NIVFO. A. Time duration. What I'm going to read for you guys now is statistics and stuff that this organization noticed. So, 
The first is about time and duration of the observations. 53% of the observations are made in the last half part of each month, i.e. from the 15th to the 30th. The duration of each observation varies from a few seconds to more than an hour. 91% of the reports deal with luminous objects seen between 5 p.m. and midnight. 43% of the observations are made after 9 p.m. The average point of time regarding observation is at 6.39 p.m. And B. Appearance. 42 reports refer to a single object. Two reports to two objects seen at the same time and three reports to four objects seen simultaneous. Three reports mention fuselage, i.e. solid objects, but without wings or anything like that. Two reports speak of windows on the objects. In one case only one window and in the other several windows. The bulk of the reports deal with luminous objects where the color is described as shiny yellow and red. From the 4th of December 1981 to the 23rd of March 1982 the majority of the colors were described as shiny, while from the 13th of August 1982 a larger number of yellow and red colors were reported. There are only three daylight observations. Here the reports deal with silver glossy or steel colored fuselages with shape as a torpedo or cigar or an airplane fuselage without wings etc. The movement of the object varies from motionless to a very great speed, looping and a kind of spiral movement. None of the phenomena have emitted any kind of sound audible to the witnesses. The distance from the observers to the phenomena varies from 10 to 50 meters up to many kilometers up in the sky. Some of the accounts. Number 1. Several times in the period between just before Christmas 1981 and January 1982, three witnesses, Ruth Mary Mo, Åge Mo and Jon Aspos from the farm Aspos in the Hestalen Valley saw a shiny luminous thing, oval or perhaps egg-shaped with a sharply defined shape, which was most often hovering around the top of Finsåhögda, about three kilometers as the crow flies from the Aspos farm. In one instance the object was seen just above a mountain pasture. Later. When they went to investigate, they found no visible traces in the snow, nor did they hear any sound from the object, because the observations lasted over 1.5 months. The weather conditions were very varied, but for the most part it was dark and clear. Nothing was observed when the weather was overcast with a low cloud cover. From the farms in Hestalen only one object has been observed at the time. It has almost always appeared from the southwest, flying with an even speed halted over Finsåhögda, descended vertically behind the mountain, then later ascending to the previous height and thereafter returning along the same path as it came by. The object was occasionally seen to descend and ascend several times behind the mountain. Number 2 on the 15th of January 
1982, Åge Mo and Jon Aspos were traveling in the mountains by snow scooter in the order to get a glimpse of the object from the Lidalen Valley. On the far side of Finsåhögda, about 10 p.m., they saw something that they at first believed to be a star very low in the northeast. But the next moment the light began to move and grew more and more powerful. At the same time, it moved towards the two witnesses. Suddenly, the light split into two luminous objects which ascended vertically while remaining close to each other before they merged and descended to the mountain again. Shortly afterwards, however, there were a total of four objects which flew to and fro in all directions. The luminosity was variable. The objects were egg-shaped, but now and then they seemed somewhat flattened. Now they were so low that they seemed to be flying lower than the mountain tops. The witnesses estimated their dimensions to be about 15 to 20 times 7 to 8 meters. And this corresponds quite well with calculations made on the basis of angular dimensions and the distance of the mountains. To the north it was somewhat cloudy, but in all other directions the sky was clear. The witnesses reported that they could see the distinct egg shape of the object quite clearly, and on one side they clearly saw a window with four crossbars. And here we have two drawings kind of a reconstruction of the sighting. They are drawings of the objects that Åge, Mo and Jon Aspos watched for an hour behind Finsåhögda. When the objects flew low in the valley or ascended, they appeared as depicted, rotating about their own axis during their main maneuvers. Incredible, incredible sighting. During a later interview, they added that the object assumed a greenish color, almost phosphorescent. The windows could be seen so clearly that they noticed that the horizontal bar was much wider than the vertical one. Out of the four panes came a yellow-white light, like that from a common electric light bulb, contrasted with the green surface of the object. Åge and Jon watched the four objects for about one hour, until they ascended vertically at a tremendous speed and disappeared. On the 20th of December 1981, many independent witnesses, among them Nils Kåre Nesvold, who was a journalist at the time, and Per Holden, saw a luminous spherical object the size of a large star. The light was constant, strongly luminous without a corona or halo. The time was 7 pm, the weather clear and dark. The object passed along a mountain ridge some 2 to 3 kilometers from the place of observation at Von Graven in Ulm, at an estimated altitude of about 1 to 2,000 meters above the mountain. The object had a rather variable speed and made changes of both course and altitude. It suddenly disappeared, as one switches off a light. Number 4 On the same day, Halvar Bakos came driving on the road from Ålen towards Hestalen. It was the Sunday before Christmas and he says, I was on my way from Ålen towards Hestalen and reached Hestalskjølen about 7 p.m. There I saw a light in the direction of the Finnåsdalen valley. The light was stationary, so I thought it was a snow scooter or a light reflected on the mountains. I didn't react to uh, this at first. I thought very strange when it later appeared that there were no snow scooter at all. It also appeared to me that one couldn't see the lights in any way from the mountains, from my side of Hestalskjøl. He went on to say that the light he observed looked like that of a light bulb, and was much larger 
than a star. He watched it while he drove about one kilometer. He didn't see it against the sky, but the whole time with the terrain as a background. Above Olden and Rugeldalen, some similar observations were made at the same time. Number 5. In the Hodalen Valley, about 21 kilometers from Røros, 14-year-old Torfinn Barstad observed a luminous object on the 11th of January 1982 at about 8 p.m., which at first resembled a big star. It came closer and stopped about 500 meters away from the witness and about 200 meters above the ground. No sound could be heard as the object hovered stationary for several minutes. Its light was powerful. Torfinn reports that it was like staring directly into a 100 watt light bulb at a distance of one meter. The size was like a house, though not so tall. The shape was oval. After some 20 minutes, the object began to move and disappeared at a great speed towards the south, downwards above Grådalshögda. Torfinn Barstad adds that he felt very sick during the entire observation, and his feeling disappeared only after the object had gone. Interesting. He had a physical reaction. Number 6. Another witness. Lars Lillevold told UFO Norge. In the evening of the 18th of January 1982, I went out of my house about 7.30 p.m. I saw an egg-shaped or oblong object over a telephone line about 30 meters from the house. It had a metallic core with a bright orange light around it. There was a soft light or energy radiating field around the thing. I am sure I could have put my fingers on it. It was like a physical object. I am almost certain it was made of metal. It hovered motionless before it began to slowly go down through the valley. I did not see any further details like windows or like no signs and there was no sound. Number 7. On the 3rd, 4th and 5th of February 1982, at 11, 10.30 and 7 plus 8 o'clock p.m., Hans Almos with five member of members of his family saw some silent, luminous objects in the sky with an even motion and speed like that of an ordinary airliner. On the first occasion, the 3rd of February, the object passed lower and closer to the witnesses than on the subsequent observations. The family saw the luminous object in the sky through the window and shortly afterwards they ran outside. The object came from the south and moved directly towards the north. At first they saw the object against the sky and during its flight it passed the mountain Svendhuken below the top with it situated about 700 meters above sea level. Olden lies some 580 meters above sea level and the mountain is about 3 kilometers from the observation site. The witnesses had binoculars through which they observed an object with lights in both ends separated by a darker area. The lights didn't seem to be as powerful as spotlights but rather to be softly luminous or perhaps to be self-illuminated objects. Seen by the naked eye there was no suggestion of rays and halos but through binoculars the light appeared stronger and showed some kind of ray effect. Speaking of the speed of the object, the witnesses compared it to that of a helicopter seen at the same distance, or an airplane seen at about 7 kilometers. This they are accustomed to, because of the regular air route passes about 7 kilometers further south. The duration of observation they estimated to be some 5 minutes. Number 8. Jon Ospos tells us about another observation he had on the night of 1st and the 2nd of April 1982. At 12.30 I saw a big oblong object which passed slowly in front of the Rognefjell mountain. The object was well illuminated and it 
came flying from the south along Hestown. I could see the object in front of the mountain on the far side of the valley, which rules out the possibility that it could have been an airplane. It is some 2.5 kilometers to Rognefjellet, and I didn't hear any sound. Rognefjelle is situated at the opposite side of Finsåhøgda. On Saturday, the 24th of April, I saw a point of light which seemed to be quite at a distance. It was at the left of Finsåhøgda, and it moved slowly in the opposite direction relative to the stars. This phenomenon lasted for about an hour and a half. During an earlier interview, it appeared that another witness had similar observation at the time. A fact that Aspos didn't know about. Hmm. Always nice to find out later that there is other witnesses to your sighting. The sighting number nine. On the 24th of September 1982, Mr. Bjarne, Lillevold and a friend were driving home from their work in the Killingdal mines when they suddenly saw a luminous object towards Hestalen mountains. The two men followed the road down towards Stensli, and after having driven about five kilometers, they saw the object begin to descend into the woods in Olm. They concluded correctly that it was remaining in the woods. When they drove further towards the center of the village, another object came flying from Hestalen and hovered just below the first one. Bjarne then took his moped and drove towards Hestalen. After having reached Hestalsjörn, he noticed that one of the objects was standing stationary by a cottage some 70 meters from the road. At first he thought the cottage was on fire, but he soon saw it was something else. By the side of the cottage, the object stood four meters above the ground and shining with a light so powerful that he was dazzled. It looked like an inverted Christmas tree and seemed to be larger than the building beside it. In front there was a pulsating red light. At the same time, there was an uneven coating outside the whole thing. The object went rapidly up and down like a yo-yo and each time it approached the ground, it seemed to vanish. He could then glimpse a spruce fir tree through it. Bjorn Lillevold adds that if he hadn't been alone, he probably would have dared to approach the object closer, which he didn't do. After about 20 minutes, it ascended and disappeared to the north, where the conditions were good with overcast. These statements are only a handful of excerpts among dozens of reports originated during the last 15 months. Unfortunately, UFO Norge has only been able to put a few of all the observations on record, in addition to investigate some of these cases thoroughly in connection with that representative from our organization and also the organization UFO Sverige have several times been in the Hesdalen area conducting field investigations. On several occasions they have made sightings of their own, some of them with photographical confirmation. This has encouraged UFO Norge, in collaboration with UFO Sverige, to consider setting up a permanent observation camp in the Hestalen Valley. The first large organized expedition was undertaken from the 17th to the 21st March 1982. Additionally, there were also organized tours 24th of September 8 and 16 and to 24th of October the same year and many of these excursions active members from UFO Norge participated among them engineer Arne Pross Thomassen journalist Arne Wist Leif Hovik division leader Mid Norway and others all were well equipped with cameras and telephoto lenses Leif Hovik tells of one of his many photo excursions. On the 17th of March we were on a four-day expedition to Hestalen. During this period we made some six sightings and took four successful pictures. A yield with which we were very pleased. 
The first time was 7.32 p.m. on the first evening. We had packed our equipment on a sledge because none of us considered the possibility of observing anything that day. But suddenly, Lars Lillevold exclaimed, There it is! And at the same moment, we ran to the road which lay about 25 meters ahead. There we stood, observing an oblong object which slowly passed in front of Finsohögda. It was completely soundless and disappeared to the north. It passed in front of the mountain top at an estimated altitude of some 600 meters. Unfortunately, we didn't. We hadn't time to get the camera equipment packed on a sledge into position before the object disappeared. Somewhat disappointed, we fetched the sledge and went to the Vårhusvollen mountain hut, which was to be our base for the following days. After a while, we returned to the Ospos Hill, where representatives from the Norwegian Air Force and some newsmen had taken their position. At 8.39, something appeared in the north and passed above Finsohögda towards west. Some pictures were taken, but they turned out to show nothing. At 45 p.m., we returned to Vårhusvollen and spent some of the night watching stars, planets and a bunch of satellites. Several airplanes were also observed, on which our attention was focused, in order to compare their appearance with our UFO observations. The next day was very successful. First we looked for landing prints in the area around Finsohögda. Unfortunately we found no traces, so we got to sleep a couple of hours in the early afternoon. At 7 p.m. we reached our observation site some 40 meters from the cottage, at about 690 meters above the sea level. Here we waited for about half an hour while we observed the sky above us. The planet Mars could be seen very clearly in spite of a few clouds, and it was thoroughly observed. Because an astronomer and a leading UFO skeptic in Norway had stated that it was the planet Mars which most people had seen as UFOs. In the meantime the clock approached 7.30 and we waited for the 7.30 rush. Suddenly at 7.33 a light appeared in the sky in the south. We could see an oblong object with a constant red light at the front end, then a yellow white light, a dark patch and then a yellow white light at the back. It seemed to be quite near, but it was not easy to estimate the distance correctly. The light appeared clearly and distinctly, but it looked as if it was covered with something. It was very strange light, or a light source which we were not accustomed to. After having watched the object for a couple of seconds, we began to shoot with our camera equipment. My colleague Kai Johansen had his camera mounted on a tripod, but I shot in hope of luck. I took a couple of pictures with the shutter on 1 15 of a second and a telephoto lens of 2 times 135 mm, though I couldn't see the UFO in the finder. In the meantime, the object passed in front of Fjellbekhögda and a short while afterwards behind Finsohögda. The distance to the object was about 2.7 kilometers, and it had an estimated length of about 25 meters. It passed with a low speed and could be seen for some 25 seconds. I am sure that its altitude wasn't very great. One of the first pictures in this series became very successful. Here we have some photos, and this is from 1982, so Mr. Lars Lillewold is pointing at the UFO. They have drawn it out, but you can't really see anything in this picture. Well, this is not the original photo, so... Alright, so it continues. The time was now 7.50 p.m. and we discussed our sighting eagerly. At 7.59 p.m. Kai Johansen spotted a red pulsating light, an object which popped up over Fjellbekhögda. It was visible for only a few seconds, so it was not possible to photograph it before it disappeared behind Finsohögda. It appeared to us as if the same object which passed at 7.33 perhaps had made a turn up in the mountains and then returned in a northerly direction. One might add that later we took a photograph of a reindeer situated at Fjellbekhögda from the same observation point and with the same camera equipment. Knowing posit 
intuitively that the reindeer was about 2 meter long, we could easily estimate the object's dimension about 25 meter. We had no more sightings that evening, and due to very cold winds, we retreated to our cottage and watched the sky in relays. On Friday the 19th of March, at 7 pm, we were at the same spot again. It was still a cold wind with temperature of 12 degrees Celsius, precisely at 7.38, there appeared a new star. Could it be a satellite? A point of light which appeared as an ordinary star made a slow movement in a northerly direction. After a while it, as it assumed a warmer, yellow-white color and it grew much larger. At the same time it seemed as if it flew low over the terrain. We shot some pictures since the star passed in front of Filbekhögda on the same course as the other objects. During this observation we checked any possible deflection on the compass, but with no reaction. Also an earth magnetic detector was tested, but again without any results. On a drawing of the successful photo, one can see an amoeba shaped object with a yellow core and a red periphery. Hmm. This was from the first excursion to Hestalm. Since that time there have been many many more, on which the participants have had similar observations. To make our report complete, we will let the division leader of UFO Norge, South Arne P. Thomassen, tell of his experience in Hestal. Okay, this is an interesting one. And Thomassen, he has a lot of experience. He has witnessed several UFO sightings. Let's see what he says here. All right. On the 25th of September, 1982 at 7:50 p.m. the first ufo popped up in the south it hovered totally motionless low over the mountain and shone and flickered because the object was motionless i was able to take two pictures on time exposure three to five seconds in that way i got the cliffs and a mountain crest in the background into the picture it was overcast and a little windy we had climbed Filbekhögda, 1078 meters above sea level, in the afternoon and settled down on a little cliff ledge in the southern declivity. Four times we observed UFO this night on three different locations. We took 81 pictures, some of which show the squared shape of the UFOs. At 9.50 pm the UFO hunt took a dramatic turn. The object, which was flying to and fro over Lake Öyungen, suddenly began to use some sort of a spotlight. The spotlight was turned in every possible direction and sometimes it lit up the clouds. Suddenly the object came in our direction and illuminated the area where we were situated. Figure 7 and 8 shows two types of UFOs observed during UFO Norge's expedition to Hestalen. 18 and the 19th of March 1982. While we are not able to print the pictures in full color in this newsletter, these drawings will roughly indicate them as they are seen from the color slides. My companion was frightened and threw himself to the ground. You know, I, I pause, but I can understand that. Seeing this spectacular sight lights moving around amoeba-shaped objects flickering and coming towards your location. Pretty scary. Okay, let's continue. Start again here. My companion was frightened and threw himself to the ground. At just that moment, the object turned away. One of the UFOs was seen by Arne Wist, just in the act of descending through the cloud cover and illuminating it. But before he reached his camera in the car, the object disappeared behind a hill. Leif Havik stood further to the west, and so the object with the spotlight came between him and me. That led him to believe that it was me shining with a lamp. The following evening, however, Arnevist succeeded in taking a couple of pictures from Fjellbekhögda towards the east, towards that part of the mountains which lies about 7 kilometers on the other side of Hestal. The next expedition started on Saturday the 16th of October and ended on Sunday 24th of October. Its climax was on Friday. 
we had taken position early at our observation site, very heavily protected with warm clothes and equipment with a Russian mirror telephoto lens with a focal length of 1000 meters in addition to a 8mm cine camera. This evening the phenomena began at 5.40 pm and we managed to get a lot of pictures. The object hovered motionless for a relatively long time over two small closed mines. And these mines were of zinc, silver and copper. And the direction was 89 degrees in relation to magnetic north. After some time the object moved a bit and was now accompanied by another one. In that way we got them on several pictures both still and moving. We decided to send signals of light with a 50 watt halogen lamp we had brought with us. Just when I began to signal one of the objects disappeared shortly afterwards the other did the same. It didn't seem that I wanted to make a closer contact. At 6.05 pm the object returned and we managed to get some final pictures before we climbed down on the mountain. At 8.20 pm we carried our equipment indoors and a blong object appeared. It flew low and soundlessly while it emitted blinking red lights from the edge. I listened for noise and a motorplane, but there were none and I became suspicious. Two pictures were taken fastly through the 400mm lens. Many people in Olden had seen this object, which flew from east to west in an altitude of some few hundred meters. Also the UFOs in the east side of the valley by Rognefjellet mountain had been observed by many people in Olden situated on the opposite side. The Norwegian army on a UFO hunt. At the end of March 1982, two officers, Captain Arne Nyland and Lieutenant Peter Reimert, both from Værnes airport near Trondheim, went to Hestalen in order to study the phenomena at, as close as possible. So far as we know, this was the first time that the Norwegian army has ever sent troops and on a UFO hunt, at least officially. The two officers lived for a short period in a tent in Hestalen, and here they tell about their experiences. We did not see any UFOs. On the contrary, we saw more than 30 shooting stars and satellites, in addition to 6 to 7 airplanes and especially a lot of UFO hunters running around in the terrain. People in Hestalen have seen luminous objects since 1944, but many years passed before they dared to tell about their observations. But their accounts are credible and the army must take them seriously. There is much between heaven and earth which cannot be explained at the first glance. Commander-in-chief for the Air Force of Southern Norway, Major General Eivind Schippi, who was responsible for the Army's UFO hunt in Hestalen, says, We have received trustworthy reports about objects, for which people cannot find any explanation. This we have to take seriously. There exist natural explanations for what people see in the night sky, but sometimes it can be hard to find the right cause. The phenomena in Hestalen could be atmospheric reflections, ball lightning or other meteorological phenomena. Hypothesis Regarding the cause of the extensive UFO activity, Arne Thomasen says, An analysis of the cause would require a thorough treatise and I am not yet ready for that, but several points are worth making. The fact that they hover motionless for minutes at a time over closed down mines, of which there are plenty in this mountain area, could suggest a various hypothesis. Generally speaking, the mountains are very rich in several minerals. Another fact is that the magnetic field of the earth here is the strongest in Norway. A third factor is that the mountain landscape around Hestalen is almost untouched by the foot of man and relatively desolate, and during the winter rather difficult of access. Most inquisitive people won't come any further than Hestalen itself, sitting in their cars with the heater at maximum. In our experience it is essential to be on 
a high level and look down on the UFO as they are moving low. It might be added that UFO Norge has on several occasions taken a magnetometer on their expeditions. So far nothing abnormal has been measured. According to measurements made by the Norwegian Geological Institute in 1965, there exists a very strong magnetic field just where some UFOs are reported to disappear. We may also mention the following. On Friday the 3rd of September 1982, three persons from NIVFO made an observational excursion to Hestalen bringing with them some technical equipment, including a new American instrument developed for the purpose of measuring electrical voltage in the air and ground, in addition to electromagnetism, especially in the connection with power lines. One of the purposes in using this instrument was to find out whether detectable changes in the electrical potential of the air occur during UFO observations. If a wind down the valley or something else could keep a gradient change of voltage of 1000 volt uh, centimeter air then for instance the durability of balls of lightning would be much longer on friday evening at 10 50 pm a luminous object suddenly popped up it made a steady flight above finsohögda and kept itself above the top before it disappeared behind it it after about 15 to 20 seconds. No sound could be heard. Seen through binoculars 7 times 50. One could see a red light in front of the object and a white light at the back. Unfortunately, the observations happened so quickly that it was impossible to take any pictures or make any technical measurements. The subsequent evening, Saturday the 4th of September, was much more successful in that respect. From 8.30 p.m. the members of the expedition had taken position at their point of observation and had trained themselves to identify the many satellites which passed in the sky. About 9.30 they saw a satellite which flew in the reverse of all the others from east to west. This object which went in the opposite direction of the Earth's rotation disappeared after some time without leaving a trace. A short while afterwards, at 9.54, excuse me, at 9.45, another object appeared near Zenith, but this was, according to the witnesses, no satellite, for it began to move around in the sky in several directions. The instrument mentioned earlier was tuned onto measuring the voltage of the air. In the same moment as the object popped up in the sky, the indicator on the instrument gave a vigorous deflection which amounted to a gradient of 100 volts per meter. Both before and after the observation, the indicator was motionless in zero position. No sources of error have been found which could have caused this deflection. So we believe that the variation of voltage is related to the observation of the unknown object. As one might expect, several hypotheses have been put forward regarding the origin of the phenomena in Hestalm. They are all old and familiar, and it is characteristic that most people are making cocksure statements without being in Hestalen themselves, or having the faintest knowledge of the details in many of the reports. The scientist Thomas McClymans at the Harbour and Watercourse Laboratory in Trondheim stated in an interview with the newspaper Adressavisen dated the 16th of March 1982. I will not maintain with 100% certainty that I know the solution to the UFO observations in Hestalen, but I think that the explanation could be this. Cold masses of air descend the valley and meet a warmer layer of air. In the division of between these two layers, there arises a mirror-like surface where light from the sun, moon or other light sources is reflected. It is a well-known phenomenon, which meteorologists designate reflection in inversion layers. Of other explanations, one can mention light from airliners, reflections from car lights, the planet Mars, and ball lightning. None of these, however, can explain all the sightings, though conceivably the explanation could be found through a combination of such phenomena. 
For the time being, however, the observed and photographed phenomena in Hestalen and also in Arndal remain unidentified. We will follow the case here in this journal and keep our readers informed. All right. So this was the first report of the Hastalen phenomena in the UFO Norge newsletter. Pretty interesting. Wish I had a sighting like that. I've seen some stuff. I'll come back to that in another video. Okay. Take care. See you later. Vi har målt hastigheter på radar da, på faktisk opp til 30 000 km i timen. Vi har også registrert på stillbilder at dette her kan bevege seg i veldig skarpe vinkler, veldig hurtig. Og man stiller seg spørsmålet, har det da masse? Kan det ha masse med den hastigheten? Den her blå lysstrålen, den treffer da toppen på et tre der borte. Og med en gang den treffer det, rett etterpå det, så forandrer den bølgelengden i hvordan den spiralerer bortover. Og da blir det mye lengre mellom hver toppen av spiralen. The results of the first four years of studies and cooperation with the Italians look pretty bad. The phenomenon exists.